This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. This episode is brought to you by Talk Python Training. The Self Taught or Not podcast is all about leveling up your career in the tech space and learning software development the right way. Python is one of the hottest languages at the moment, and you don't need a CS degree to be part of this excitement. Our friends over at Talk Python Training have nearly 200 hours of professional grade online Python courses. If you want to learn Python for about the price of a book on your own, just visit talkpython.fm slash self taught to find your next level. That's talkpython.fm slash self taught. It'll also be in our show notes at self taught or not.com. Thanks. All righty. Today we have a special guest on David Tang on the Self Taught or Not podcast. David Tang is the author of the Pro Ember Data book published by A-Press. He's also a senior software developer. Uh, we really want to deep in, uh, in this interview, we want to deep dive into book publishing. I know David also creates online courses. He also uh, works at a company called Audit Board. He's a university lecturer, an adjunct lecturer. Uh, welcome aboard, David. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. And of course, we always, as always, Dylan is here. I'm here. My co co host <laughs> with the mostest. <laughs> so we'll both be uh, interviewing David today. So let's just start off with uh, I gave a little bit of a background. What uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, David, and how you got into development? Sure. Yeah. So uh, currently, right now, I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Audit Board. We make auditing software, so that's kind of my full time gig. As my part time gig, I work. Um, I'm an adjunct lecturer at USC, so the University of Southern California, and I teach uh, web development courses to um, students usually in their junior and senior year. So they're They've already learned like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, like the basics at that point. And so I kind of dive into the framework aspect. So whether it's um, currently it's React for the front end stuff and then Laravel for the back end. Um, so I've been doing that for about 10 years and, and that's been a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I recently released uh, my book, Pro Ember Data, which we can get more into that later. And, you know, I kind of have some other um, side gigs like uh, publishing a course on SitePoint. Yeah, that's really cool. He sounds like you're doing a lot of things. Just <laughs> before we get deep dive into it, do you require your students to buy your book? <laughs> People ask me that all the time. No, I don't because um, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, it's you know the book is on Ember data, and uh, I don't actually teach Ember anymore. I used to, but even at the time, I think it was probably too advanced for most people. So. The, the stuff I taught, at least when I was teaching Ember, I usually taught the happy path. So my book is more of like the, uh, when you get into the weeds with, at a big company and how do you use Ember data? So it doesn't really fit that, but, um, yeah, nowadays I'm, I'm teaching react, so <laughs> it doesn't really apply anymore. That's funny. I, a little side tangent here. When I created my first book was the Ember JS cookbook also in the Ember world. My, you know, I was talking to a few people and they're like, you should go and talk to university professors and have them buy your book. Cause that's like 30 or 40 books a pop. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, maybe I should like try to get on the, on the, some curriculum of some professor somewhere to get my book in there. You know, Dylan's had experience with this. I think Dylan, you've told me once that you've had professors reach out to you and they've used your YouTube videos, right? Yeah. A couple of them where they would specifically when trying to get the students to ramp up and uh in you know sort of pre-course work because i i know back when i was actually in school it, you just sort of hit the ground running if you don't have any sort of programming background you're not going to get it in the two weeks when you dive into it so some of them would uh, recommend the sort of free code camp tutorials i'd be doing walking through and you know send them 40 hours of videos so work through before they even start the course and i think it's probably pretty helpful because uh, i know for me just being exposed to it in class the first time things feel pretty fast that's funny that you mentioned that because i actually do pull a lot of articles and youtube videos as additional resources for my class um, just because it would, it would take me a really long time to create that all myself so 
uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's great having content out there that is very focused, short, and and very beginner too. That's great. I remember when I was when I went back to school to get a, a master's, but it was in for an, uh, a master's of business, and one of the professors was a YouTuber, and he would play some of his YouTube videos, not too often, but every now and then he's like, "Oh, did a YouTube video on this," and we always thought it was like a little weird that he did it. <laughs> Um, but it was always interesting when he he pulled other people's YouTube videos up. Um, we thought those were were better. I guess that's is that the so David. So as being a teacher for the last eleven ten years, is so how how has that changed from what you, when you started ten years ago to today? How like your teaching style? Yeah, I think uh, in the beginning, I mean, I, I've definitely grown as a teacher and figured out like what works and what doesn't work. Um, I would say the biggest change kind of every every year is kind of having to keep up with the technologies. So I think when I first started, I was teaching, I think, like Backbone and Angular, and then now it's React, but I've probably taught every single framework out there. So having to kind of constantly update the course, that's uh, kind of a big thing. And then, you know, with the pandemic now, now everything's actually on Zoom. So the past year I've been teaching on Zoom as opposed to going in person. Um but usually I, my, my teaching style has kind of stayed the same where I go into class and I usually do kind of a, um, a live uh, coding demo that I prep ahead of time. So I'm not like it's not fully live, but um, I kind of go off some some notes and, and a you know, pull request that I made just to kind of um, use as a guide <laughs> so I don't make any mistakes. But overall, my teaching style has uh, kind of stayed the same. And I think students have really appreciated it because at least in my evaluations, people kind of really, I think, like that style where you kind of go slow and you live code and they can follow along. I like that. In in our boot camp episode, we had a set, we were talking about, me and Dylan were talking about how a lot of com- uh, universities and maybe even USC have now their own boot camp programs, which aren't accredited. You don't get a degree or anything at the end, but they usually have some sort of certificate. Is your classes like a part of the undergraduate or graduate degree programs, or is it part of one of these boot camps that the universities put together? Yeah, uh, so the department I work for, they're called um, the Information Technology Program, and it's kind of under engineering. So uh, we don't actually have any majors, but we do offer certificates, and and students can kind of take the courses and get one of those certificates, but they can also u- take those courses and use them as uh, electives for both undergraduate and graduate degrees. So um, I know a lot of engineering and computer science students, like they'll take it as kind of like a a tech elective, or um, I'll also get students from like, you know, economics or something, and they just want to learn more about technology. And so they might uh, either get a certificate, or if they take a few more courses, then they'll uh, actually, they can get like a full minor in it. But um, there is no majors uh, as of yet. Very, very neat. One That reminds me, it just you know, with the criticism we sometimes hear of the university system, there still is, you know, people like David. I remember when I, even when I was back in school many uh, many years ago, that there was even grad students teaching like modern day, you know, tools and, and modern day frameworks and libraries that you use in the real world. So there, you know, for universities being a little bit behind The Times is usually the often criticism you hear about it. There's still classes, especially elective classes that that really, you know, help people out. Yeah, yeah. I I can understand the criticism just because I have seen uh, other like web development courses at the university and, you know, the topics on there, they're pretty outdated. And so I try not to be that. Um, In fact, actually, I the, the two courses I teach, I created them and they were to address that specific problem. So to like teach. Uh, kind of modern day web development and help um, uh, address like all those skills that students see on job postings that that they might not necessarily learn in their other classes and hopefully it kind of ramps them up to at least have practical skills to get a real job. So I, you know, I do have to keep up quite a bit and constantly update things because, you know, as you guys know, like technology changes so fast and, you know, this year it's, it's React or next year it's something else. So as long as the the skill is still like very uh, practical and marketable, you know, it's cool to teach, but uh, it does take a good amount of time to kind of, um, you know, update the courses for that. Yeah, I wonder so, if that sort ahead. of trend is going to continue in the sense of like, I kind of felt like 
the changes in technologies have been sort of slowing down. Like instead of every change in framework every couple of years, we're more so changing libraries that we use. And there really hasn't been like the last decade has been a lot of innovation, but the last year or two feels to me like things have sort of um, slowed down, but may maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think in the beginning, yeah, I was kind of, I was changing them a bit more because it went, I think, you know, the various stages I went through was um, teaching uh, Backbone and then eventually like Angular 1 and then uh, I think maybe Ember and then eventually landed on React. But um, yeah, it does seem like it has kind of slowed down a bit. For the backend class I teach, I teach uh, Laravel, which is a PHP framework, and that that has actually stayed pretty consistent. So there's been less churn on the backend side. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's that's great. Um, yeah, I think I, to, to Dylan's point, things have slowed down a little bit. I feel like maybe yeah, six seven years ago it was it was the flavor of the month Java framework, and now it's I guess you call them like meta frameworks. Now it's the the flavor of the month of the meta framework. So instead of going from React, so we have React, React Vue, Angular, Swell, Ember, but now we're like okay, now we have Nuxt and Next <laughs> and and Gatsby and Gridsum and like I'm starting to see more of those those kind of meta frameworks kind of built on top of React and Vue more often. You guys don't get to the point of teaching those, do you? You just you're just teaching uh, still like the fundamentals of React. Yeah, I mean I don't even get into like Redux or anything. I just kind of teach uh, component based uh, frameworks and you know just understanding how to build components and build applications with components. And so it's just like raw React. It's yeah, I don't. Uh, I think the only other thing I get into is uh, React Router, but I don't really dive into like the whole Redux and architecture and kind of all that. So it's it is pretty uh, basic. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's uh, let's take a step back. Let's talk about um how you got into development. Uh, wh what's kind of like your your origin story there? Yeah. So uh, I, I mean. When I was in school, it, I was majoring in industrial and systems engineering. And so I kind of took an internship at a company uh, called the Aerospace Corporation. And this was in my junior year, I think um, like 2006 or seven. And, you know, one of the first projects that uh, they handed me was like, hey, can you update our website? And so, you know, I knew nothing about HTML then. So I just kind of started uh, tinkering and looking into it. And I realized, oh man, this is actually a lot of fun. And I, I just really enjoyed the day prior, you know, prior before them handing me that I was kind of like, ah, this is kind of boring. I don't know if I really like this major. Um, so after that, I decided to take a few classes, you know, while I was in school and I took some, you know, introductory web development classes on HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, at the time they were using uh, cold fusion. If anyone has ever heard of that <laughs> um, and a little bit of PHP and MySQL. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I took, you know, some of those, the same classes that um, I have taught uh, at USC. And, you know, I think it helped because at least it got my, um, the fundamentals down. And then from there, kind of after that, I did a lot of self-learning on kind of more advanced topics that came up like in interviews and just building side projects. And eventually, um, you know, I, I got my jobs now. My first job, I actually did pursue something that was targeted towards my major. I lasted about 11 months there. And then I realized ah, that I didn't really like this. So I kind of, I did actually take a pay cut and joined another company that my friend had started. And um, it, this way I could kind of focus full time on web development. And, you know, I, I'm glad I did that because I think the older I would have gotten, if I had stayed in it, I would have been more afraid to maybe make that career transition. But since it was early on, you know, I was fine taking the pay cut. Um, but that actually didn't last very long because I think, you know, uh, salaries in, in tech tend to be, you know, pretty good. So, um, you know, from there, I, I was able to kind of jump off and, and increase salary and get some pretty, um, some pretty great jobs doing uh, web development full time. There's a lot to unpack there. But I, I, there's a lot of interesting threads, but uh, you know, I'll ask why. So after you had graduated, you said you kind of jumped from you ended up changing jobs, and that was very difficult for you. So what do you think about kind of how long should you stay at a job? Um, when should you leave? Let Let's talk about that. How's how have you decided in your career? 
when's the when's the right time to leave and when's the right time to stay because it seems like you've had a few jobs since you graduated and and I understand that's that's really a difficult decision for a lot of developers. Yeah, I think so I did a lot of self-learning on the side and usually, you know, I think when you're in tech and and you get a lot of you know, a good amount of recruiter emails and you see all these opportunities and Along with that, you know, I usually ask like the recruiter if they didn't provide that information already is like, you know, what type of salaries uh, were they offering? So I know with my, you know, after I had my like second job, which was doing pretty well um, and I was learning a lot, I was like, okay, you know, I, you know, all these opportunities kind of start presenting themselves in my emails. Uh, I do get curious and, uh, and, you know, I think earlier on in my career, I was probably switching jobs maybe every one and a half to two years. Um, I don't know if that's the best decision, but either way, I think it worked out pretty well for me because I think switching jobs and uh, increasing your salary that way ends up being much faster than kind of just staying somewhere and kind of waiting for that raise. Um, I think that's just kind of the unfortunate truth. So, uh, you know, you know, you, you might have a great company and if you love your job, maybe it's worth staying. But, you know, at least from what I found, switching was the, the quickest way to not only increase salary, but also to kind of get that like senior title that <laughs> I think, um, you know, can also help with salary, too. Yeah. What's I, you, Dylan? Yeah, I mean, my my point's pretty similar. I, I tend to agree. Um, I think one thing, other not only just the salary is when you start jumping around you get introduced to different people so your network goes up you get introduced to um, different technologies different skill sets and there's a lot that i think you can bring to the table for future employers if you have been a one-trick pony and spent five years at a job yeah you're going to be very good at that organization but you might bring less to the table than i think you would if you went to four different organizations where you've now be able to sort of uh, mix and match of the good and the bad, and you can bring additional things that other candidates couldn't. I think this is also one of the reasons internal transfers typically make less than external transfers because externally they're bringing something new in, while internally you're just sort of transferring over. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think I've definitely learned a lot by having switched jobs. Like in the beginning, I was doing more full stack stuff, and then when I switched, I kind of switched into something that was focusing more on like that uh, single page application development. And so I was kind of forced into these unique uh, situations that had, you know, different technologies or different um, constraints. Cause you know, whether it's a small company, there might be like maybe more greenfield, but if you go to a larger company, I was at Verizon for four years and I saw like, you know, the challenges there just because uh, you know, with a bigger company, there's a lot more code that's already established. So you know, you have to kind of figure out how do you modernize in, in something that's are, uh, already existing without like throwing it away, right? Because that's not very efficient either. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with that, with your comment. <laughs> the hard part is that companies know this too. So they have a lot of incentives to keep you at a company for longer. So here comes the stock options that only vest if you stay there for over one year and then you don't get all of them until you've been there for four or five years or 401ks that don't that have a one-year cliff if you leave in the first year you don't get the matching bonus so it seems like companies are getting more craftier at keeping their tech workers yeah longer. It, totally I, yeah if you're in one of those unique situations where the startup's doing really well and you have options maybe it might be in your best interest like financially to stay until at least you know the ipo or get acquired or something but um, yeah, it's a it's a good position to be in the old golden handcuffs. Like, oh, woe is me. I guess I'll stick around two more years and collect a couple hundred grand in stock options. Like, it's, a, it's not the worst <laughs> situation to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but we'll have to say though that that doesn't happen on, at all companies. A lot of companies, you know, a lot of smaller mom and pops uh, looking for good developers aren't going to offer you tons of stock options. So. Is a unique situation, but once you start moving to the larger companies, to the to the Fang type companies, yeah, you'll see that more often. Or or startups too. That's a good point with David and startups. Do you like working at startups more than these big, huge companies? Um, 
Yeah. So I, you know, mixed opinions on that. So I think it depends on the startup. Like the one I'm working at now is really great and they're growing really fast. So it's, it's been a, a really great working experience. I have worked at, um, you know, a startup in the past and that didn't do so well. And, and I actually had left, um, you know, before anything happened. So I did kind of have to buy the options and I took that risk, but it didn't actually work out for me financially. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a loss, but it wasn't huge. Um, so that's like something to be aware of. Like, you know, I think most startups aren't like fully successful. And uh, you, I guess you really have to um, believe in the business if, if you're going to like pay for those. Uh, but in terms of like, you know, working at a large company versus small company, uh, they've both been pretty good. I think uh, Verizon was a really great working experience. Um, it, it originated from a startup. And so, you know, I, I still got to do a lot of like greenfield development, which I think is kind of the most fun and probably what a lot of develop, developers enjoy. Uh, but it was in the context of a larger company. So I did kind of have to work with some older systems and everything and try to figure out like, how do I, you know, modernize this bit or bring this new technology, which, you know, was Ember at the time to, uh, into this application, but, you know, overall it was a really great working experience. Um, startups, I'd say one thing I really like is being able to, uh, kind of work in different tech stacks. I've been, you know, at my current job, I've been doing some back end, some front end, and even some like react stuff, even though it's primarily Ember. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I would have had that experience necessarily at a, at a bigger company. Um, I did interview at uh, Apple a few times kind of earlier in my career when I was at my first startup and I actually did get an offer, but I did turn it, I did turn it down uh, for kind of a number of reasons. I think, um, you know, some of the, the, the tech didn't interest me as much and, you know, uh, I guess it just wasn't as exciting as, you know, the other opportunities that had presented themselves. So, you know, I think, I imagine a lot of people look up to some of these bigger companies and like, you know, that's the ideal place to work. Uh, but yeah, actually having gone through it, um, I'm kind of glad I made that choice. Yeah. So that, Dylan, that, you yeah. That's very fine. interesting to me. Cause like, um, I, you know, I, I work at Amazon. So like I, I recently, but like, even if I had got an offer for at Amazon or one of these big sort of, you know, Apple type companies, and I just thought it was going to be hell. I probably would have been of the mindset like, oh, I'll just put two years in here and then maybe it will make, you know, for the resume. And that will be enough, even if the technology doesn't interest me. So it was like, it's very interesting to hear because uh, you didn't see the, the, the benefit. What do you think? Uh, what, do, what was the, the major, like, if you were to point out one thing where it's like, this is, this was the defining thing that I got out of not accepting that role, or this was the thing that pushed me into this other one and this other opportunity. Cause it sounds like you turned it down for something else, right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess at the time it was, it was for a few different reasons. Like, um, I did decide to teach like full time at the time, um, <laughs> which I ended up going back to part time, but kind of at the time that was my two decisions was like teach full time or do that. But I think the thing that really got me was kind of, one money wasn't, I wouldn't say it was like that good, but maybe I could have done a better job negotiating. And then but mm -hmm. probably the biggest thing was like the technologies. And I was just like, ah, I didn't really want to work with that. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, overall, I mean, it, it, you know, um, still what, sometimes I wonder like, huh, maybe I made the right choice. Cause I know there's a lot of like resume equity there. Like if I, you know, you have Apple on your resume, Hey, maybe that would have been uh, pretty worthwhile to have, but who knows? Either way, I guess like my career has turned out um, pretty good and, and I'm happy with it. So <laughs> I think at a certain point when you have like you, David, when you have over 10 years of experience at this point and you've worked with multiple big companies and you have a book under your name, I think getting past the initial uh, gatekeepers that a lot of companies have when they sift through resumes. I think your your resume probably goes to the top of most lists just with all the experience and things you've done. Uh, yeah, I haven't really I haven't yeah, I haven't really applied with my like raw resume in a while cuz even my current job has was kind of more of a referral situation, but uh hopefully that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, part of the reason I I you know do all these little side gigs not just cuz I'm interested in them, but also I think it helps kind of um 
kind of yeah build up uh, kind of your um, your recognition, so it makes it a little bit easier to get jobs in the future. <laughs> Yeah, I think be, both me and Dylan definitely felt like just putting ourselves out there has helped us at least open the doors for a lot of interviews. Now, passing those interviews, <laughs> fortunately, That's another thing. Super, super, <laughs> yeah, yep, it's definitely, definitely going to be a, a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I think even to this day, like you know, sometimes I'll, I am throwing those interview questions, and I'm like, oh man, I've, I've done a few of those leak codes, and and they get kind of hard, so. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of me or somebody new, like, I think we all probably struggle through that stuff since we don't, most of us probably don't do that stuff on the day to day. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, uh, I generally enjoy solving some of those problems, but I mean, leak code specifically, you know, after you get past the first 10 or 20, you're like, man, I really have to like, Am I back in school? Like, I really have to think about these things to start problem solving. And like, especially me, I work in the front end. So most of the time, it's nothing too complicated. But I've, I have the, I've had this sort of question for a, a lot of guests when we've had interviews is, what do you think should change about the interview process? Because I kind of feel like the way that most organizations with these sort of, you know, multiple algorithm type problems isn't always the best way to figure out who who you should hire. Um, I mean, maybe you do think that, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are about sort of the interview process and what you would change. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the leak code approach is generally not the best because I have seen at least having interviewed people, I've seen people do really well at kind of either those because they're either fresh out of school or they're leak coding every day. But then maybe when it comes to the practical or uh, the practical side, they're either missing the skills there and it takes them still a while to ramp up or the opposite where people are really good at the practical stuff, but then don't leak code every day. And so they, you know, maybe don't even get past like the phone screen and, and they could have been really great people to work with. So I think like my ideal interview is either um, kind of the code test thing at home is, is generally fine, or maybe doing something where you're kind of pair programming together over like one hour and you build something. Um, I think that gives a pretty good idea of like, how would working this with this person be like, and then also asking like a, a range of like technical questions that are, that don't involve like whiteboarding. So like, I don't know, design a REST API is kind of one that I usually like to ask and, and, uh, you know, just seeing kind of like where their experience is at. Um, but those sorts of questions generally do, I, I think can give a pretty good indicator if, you know, I would like working with this person and then also having questions that like focus on like the behavioral side, I feel like there's not really enough of that. It's, it's probably like 90%, if not a hundred percent technical and kind of the, the behavioral side is, is just like, you know, what you kind of gather during the technical. Yeah. I think it's a, an excellent point because so much software engineering is about being a team member and, you know, you could be the most technical person in the world and get a job and just suck being on a team with people. And, I don't know. Like I, I, it's rare, I think for very good interviews, like technical interviews, not to get a job based off of the um, personality traits or based off of how they might be a good team member. Like you literally have to be like, you know, I think this guy's kind of a serial killer. Like it has to be pretty extreme <laughs> if you do well in the technical interview. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Let's, let's, jump off that point there and talk a little bit about and you've talked to you mentioned this a few times uh ember so you obviously have been big in the ember community for many years uh, you've taught ember in your university classes you've wrote a, a book about ember js uh, i remember just for people who who have been following me and for a while i actually had a really old podcast like in 2015 or 2016 called career.js and in that podcast uh, David was actually part of it, and we interviewed people about uh, about web development. A lot more interviews than this podcast. But you, uh, even back then, you would uh, you were I think you were even writing the book back then at that point. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So I was I originally started that book as a series of blog posts, and and then I kind of realized I could turn this into a book and make it a little bit more. Um, give it a, a good order and somebody could progressively learn Ember data, which is what it's about. And, and so it kind of, you know, I still wrote some blog posts, but um, I did kind of write the book and publish it via lean pub. 
And, and through those blog posts, you know, that kind of drove traffic to my blog. And then kind of at the end of those things, I usually put like a, a little marketing thing saying, hey, if you're interested in learning more, check out my book, um, Ember Data in the Wild, which is what it was called. And, and they could, people could buy it on LeanPub. And um, yeah, and so that, yeah, I think, uh, you know, that lasted a good four years and then eventually, yeah, sold it off or, or kind of uh, signed a deal with A Press to um, traditionally publish it. And so through the last four or five years, you've been updating it and, and cause Ember data, I remember, so I used to be big in the Ember community and fortunately in the last few years, I've kind of moved over to the view community, but I still enjoy Tom Dale and Yehuda Katz and all those guys that really made Ember big. And I um, had not been, I actually went to the a conference in 2018, I think a, or 2017, I think it's the last time I've been to one of their Ember comps. But I remember that Ember Data was like their kind of state management system and that it had a lot of cool features where it would automatically like grab data for you. Do You, don't, you didn't have to write uh, a fetch statement or your HTTP um, statements because you can kind of build it in to grab it from this JSON API backend endpoint. So it did a lot of magic for you, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess at a high level to just kind of briefly explain it, it's um, it is kind of like a the simplest way to think about it. I think is like kind of an ORM for the client for interacting with REST APIs, and um, and so you know, I guess the what it's usually often compared to, I think, is like Redux. Um, I haven't really used Redux. I just conceptually have an idea of what it is, but I think it's somewhere along those lines. But uh, yeah, if you need to like pull data from your API and then create new data and send it back to the API to persist it, you know, that's kind of what Ember Data does. And out of the box, it kind of supports a few different uh, um, like RESTful conventions. Um, but those don't necessarily kind of translate to exactly what you're working with in the workplace. And so that's kind of what my book is about is like, how do you take... Uh, you know, an API that was written by one API developer, or, th or they just have their own like sets of conventions. And how do you use that with Ember data? Because the library is very powerful. It's, um, I like it because it's like a same default for just managing data in the client. And, and, you know, maybe it's not perfect, but it, it is like a, a really nice set of defaults, and it just works well. So, but then, you know, how do you translate that to like, uh, kind of a, a real working scenario where, um, you know, maybe there is an API at your workplace and it is following kind of, it is very restful, but it just doesn't necessarily follow the exact conventions of the Ember data expects. So how do you kind of like adjust Ember data to account for all those scenarios? Um, yeah, so that's kind of, you know, high level overview of Ember data. Yeah, I remember back in the day, you'd be like, okay, I'm using Ember.js in the front end. Most Ember developers back then use Rails in the back. And then it's like, okay, well, I have to create my backend endpoints in the specific manner so that way Ember data would work correctly. And yeah. Like, no, that's, that, that's the opposite of what you should probably do. You probably should should actually modify Ember data so it works with your backend endpoints instead of the other way around. So it felt like, yeah, it was really powerful, but you kind of had to understand how to look underneath the hood and, and change the defaults to really make it work with your backend API. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's a good point because a lot of Ember devs kind of do use Rails. And, and then I was in that situation where I was working at uh, Verizon and, you know, they weren't using Rails, but they had uh, kind of a .NET and some Python APIs and they were all kind of following their own conventions. You know, for the most part, they were consistent, but there were some that were kind of one-offs. So I was like, oh, okay, it's not super restful. So like, how do I use this Ember thing? Because you know, I think Ember brings a lot to the table, but um if you need to kind of use with these wildly different APIs, it's a bit of a struggle as someone new to Ember because Ember data is very prominent when when you see someone like learning about it. it. It usually gets referenced kind of in that introductory post. So it's like, how do you use that thing? And and so, you know, I kind of saw that, that need for uh, kind of more content around learning how to use it for custom APIs. I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure I was not the only person in that boat who had to work with an API that was not like Rails convention based. And so, um, you know, I just kind of started writing those blog posts and eventually turned it into a book. And, you know, you know, I marketed it a few different ways, but, um, you know, eventually, uh, you know, I think, you know, got a good number of readers too. So I was able to like sell 443 copies on my own. 
That's wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it definitely feels like there's a big need for it. So let's let's look at a little bit bigger on the Ember ecosystem. I mean, I, I just looked at the state of JavaScript survey for 2020, and fortunately, Ember is 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 a little bit lower on the list of interest of <laughs> of frameworks out there. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, is it where, where is the Ember community now? Are they trying? Are they trying to reach out? I don't. Obviously, I'm not asking you to be the spokesman for the Ember community, but like, what's your personal thoughts on like popularity? And are they trying to reach out to new developers? Or, I mean, they've definitely made it uh, a much friendlier uh, framework to to onboard someone with and and get going. Because I mean, there's a lot of concepts that have been simplified or things that have have been removed uh, from Ember. And so now they kind of recently released this uh, what they call additions. And so it's like a um, it's like a new set of features that kind of coherently work together, but they called it uh, Ember Octane. And it is much simpler. So I think from like a technical standpoint, it's it's very beginner friendly and, it, you know, it can get really, um, somebody can get up and running quickly. But yeah, from the, unfortunately, from like the marketing side, I haven't really, I mean, I know there's people kind of working on it, but uh, yeah, it, for whatever reason, it hasn't really taken off and it does kind of go down in those series, which <laughs> makes me sad a little bit, but I have no idea how you fix that. That seems very tough just because I think there's like a certain name and, and you know, people hear Ember and they think, oh, maybe so, you know, and, and there's also like, you know, I think most of the market share is in React and Vue, so um seems hard to kind of break that. I don't know if like changing the name would do it, but uh, yeah, it's a tough thing. Um, but I know, I, you know, there's still a good number of people using it. So at least it's like the, the core of Ember users that were kind of originally there, there's still a good number of them still. I think change the name is an excellent idea. Just rebrand it, remarket it, say it's new and people will dive right back into it. <laughs> that'd be, yeah, that, that'd be great if that, if it was that simple. Um, I don't know if they've considered that. <laughs> I can't remember. I thought like a couple of years ago, or maybe it was three years ago at this point, there was some sort of Ember spinoff framework that was super reactive and fast, and it was like didn't have everything that Ember had. Do you remember the name? Oh, yeah, that was uh, Glimmer JS. Yeah. Yeah, and, and most of that has actually been rolled back into Ember itself, and so that's under kind of that Ember Octane umbrella. Um, so yeah, I think like, you know, even then I, I don't, I don't know how much traction that gained. I think that was very alpha at the time. So I think even on the page, it may have said like, Hey, this is alpha. So don't maybe consider this for your next production app, like <laughs> use it to tinker with. I could be wrong there, but, um, yes, yeah, so I don't know if that deterred people away. So, but yeah, I mean, most of those, you know, all that stuff has kind of been pulled back into main Ember, Ember Octane. And so like, um, uh, you know, all those features, like um, all those modern features, I think developers expect is now back into Ember. But, you know, since then, people have probably already moved on and invested in something else. So it's like, you know, you know, why go back to Ember? And, and I think there's also the part where it's like, if you're a front end dev at a company, you're not going to really have a whole lot of influence on changing the tech stack. <laughs> so it's like, uh, unless, you know, it's for a side project or something, you'll probably just continue learning like what you're already doing at work. Did, and then the Ember still has classes, right? Yeah, so they had like the what they call classic classes, which look a lot like the um, classes in Backbone. If anybody uh, you know remembers that, where you would say like dot extend. This was all kind of like before native classes, but yeah, Ember has native classes now, so you know it feels a little bit more modern, which is which is nice. Yeah, I think that's also part of it. I think at some point the community. I think even right now, I wonder what Dylan thinks about this. I think it's a little split on OOP and classes in JavaScript. I think the React community pretty much shunned it to use <laughs> hooks uh, to go for the hooks way of doing things. And almost, I keep on, you know, maybe it was bigger last year, but I kept on hearing, oh, I'm rewriting my whole React app with hooks and getting rid of classes. And it feels like Angular and Ember are, are still holding on to it for dear life. Um, <laughs> Angular, obviously, is still doing well, so. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's funny. As native classes made its way into Ember, uh, that's when uh, those were no longer cool. <laughs> but as like an interesting tangent, you know, I, I you know, I've taught uh, React twice at least, 
for my courses at USC. And the first time I taught it, I taught it using class-based components because I think, yeah, at the time, uh, hooks were still kind of new. And, and so like, I was like, I also didn't really know them that well. So it didn't really go that route. And then this, um, in uh, last semester, I, I taught it using, uh, yeah, function components and hooks. And, and I think, I think students actually, just based on my experience, it seemed like students understood the class-based version much better. But I did a quick little poll on Twitter. I was like, you know, before the semester, I was like, okay, should I teach this in classes or, you know, functions with hooks? And everybody said functions with hooks because that was the future. So I was like, okay, let me do that. But now I'm like, huh, maybe it probably would have been simpler, like a simpler model to kind of wrap your head around if I had gone the class-based route. Yeah, I, I, so I, I don't have a very strong opinion on React. I think their, their whole library and framework puts in a bunch of anti patterns. And I, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I know like 90% of the dev community is in love with React and Redux, um, which I think is equ equivalent to essentially storing everything globally, which is like rule number one of not what not to do. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I tend to agree. I remember trying to teach uh, my girlfriend at the time was learning uh, React and she I was trying to just explain the essentially functional classes versus just or functional uh, components versus class based. And it's the classes make a lot more sense, I think, from a conceptual standpoint, because it's something that is much easier transferred to. I, I kind of think when you start talking about sort of the functional hooks, it's just, it's a little bit more black magic for people who aren't super comfortable with some higher level items of like, well, why would we do it this way? Like the why I think is much harder to understand for, especially as you are you know getting started with something like that. Yeah, totally. Right. Do you know if, um, if React plans to like deprecate classes or continue just going this functional route, um, I don't keep up to date, you know, that much on React, but. Uh, I, I don't. So I just started working in React again uh, about six weeks ago. And it's like every, every, every once, like once a year I go and jump into, you know, build something small in React, just check it out. Most of what I've worked on has been Angular Review, but I don't, I don't know. I, there's a lot of things about React that drives me a little nuts, to be honest. The, um, I'm not a fan of JSX, and I, I think that's sort of, uh, I was sort of getting off topic, but um, I, don't, I don't think they even can deprecate it because, like, the, how do you deprecate JavaScript, right? Like, it's classes. It's, uh, all that's really happening is they're extending a class that they've defined. Um, I would assume so in the background, anyhow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, definitely the the popularity of frameworks and libraries seem to change all the time. But uh, it seems like TypeScript's now hot again in the last year. I haven't even gotten into so that hot. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for React devs. I wonder with Ember what uh, what they're going to do if they're going to try to steal some thunder from React. <laughs> They'll probably be two years behind. They'll probably by the time they they do functional components or something, they'll be like. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It's already uncool. Now we have some other way to do it. So they're probably good to stick with, with what they're doing. Do you, uh, do you think that they're still really, uh, so since Ember probably has a lot less developers out there, um, than, than React and of course, uh, Vue and, and Angular, is it still a good career move to become an expert in Ember and, and try to find a company that uses it? Because, They'll probably, I'm assuming, probably pay you more. It'll probably be more greenfield. Um, yeah, I think there's like pluses and minuses to it. Like on the plus side, if you do find an Ember gig, you can probably command a higher salary. And maybe that comes along with um, maybe a little bit more uh, like <laughs> job security in a way, if you know Ember. Um, but it does, all, you know, as a con, like it does make it harder to find other Ember jobs. So I don't know if I would invest a hundred percent in Ember like myself. Um, you know, I, I know Ember just cause I've worked with it for like five years, but, uh, I don't know if I would like a hundred percent continue investing only in that. Um, I, I feel like at this point, even just from my work experiences and stuff, like, you know, I know it pretty well. So like interviewing for another Ember job, you know, I probably know most things already. Um, so kind of 
in terms of like what I learned now, it's still kind of, you know, I still kind of dabble in, in React and, and kind of keep somewhat up to date on that just to uh, kind of future proof my skill set because who knows, you know, you know, on some of these things. I think Ember will probably be here though for a while because LinkedIn has invested in it and like their main app is built on Ember. And I think they hire like a majority of the core team. So like there's people still working on it. Now without LinkedIn, uh, I'd be a little uh, afraid of the future of Ember just because, um, uh, you know, there, yeah, there's there's just not a ton of people, um, you know, I would say like, well, I can't say 100% for sure, like how many people outside of LinkedIn are working on it. But I know like, you know, if it, like personally for me, like if I wanted to contribute back, like I only have so much time after work and unless my company gave me that amount of time to kind of work on it, I, I don't know if I would necessarily do it just because, you know, after work, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? It's, yeah, I, I only have so much time in my life. Yeah. So do you have still some Ember repositories on GitHub that you maintain for the community? I don't really do a whole lot of open source. I usually, if anything, it's just like write my own blog post based on things I learned. And sometimes I'll contribute back to like the documentation because those things are pretty, um, I think, straightforward too. But like hopping into the Ember code base itself, you know, that's, that's I think that's a, another um, challenge and takes a lot of time. So usually when I start contributing back to open source is when like, I'm upgrading Ember for, you know, the company I'm working at and I find some bug in something and something needs fixing. Okay. You know, in those cases, like sometimes I can make a pull request and usually that's like an add on or something like not Ember itself. If it's usually in Ember itself, like those are usually hard to figure out. So I, I, you know, tend not to, you know, just wait for somebody else to find it. Yeah, it just reminds me, I mean, definitely with the Ember community kind of shrinking over the last few years, I know a lot of the big Ember rights, Ember people have moved on to different frameworks. I remember Lauren Tan used to be really big in the Ember community, and then she moved to Netflix, and now she's uh, at Facebook, and she does a lot of React now. And I, and I think she still has like hundreds, not hundreds, but she has many different open source repositories in the Ember ecosystem that she's sort of had to give away to other people to maintain now yeah. because she just doesn't have enough time to, to do all that work anymore. I think some of those are just abandoned at this point. That's kind of the problem with with when frameworks uh, start to kind of go out of style is that when the community starts leaving, you kind of get these a lot of these uh, projects that aren't maintained anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's also the hardest part about like upgrading Ember. So it's like you, you have these like, you know, your app dependent on some at library or add on or whatever. And, and then it gets kind of stale and, you know, who really has time to update some of these things since sometimes digging into it is, is a little bit more involved than you'd like. And it takes more than like 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I hope for the best for Ember just cause I still really enjoy using it. And, uh, um, I think it's a great technology. It's just, you know, maybe, uh, Maybe people need to give it a chance, but, you know, I guess if you have only so much time, I don't know. I, I can, I can see why, you know, people wouldn't. I'd also say the, the cool thing is that if you learn Ember or React or Angular, it's like, you don't have to learn one framework or library for your whole life. <laughs> a lot of us uh, started off learning jQuery or, or Backbone. I, I think Ember was my probably, if you, unless you consider jQuery, probably Ember was my first real framework I learned, but it was a great starting off point. You know, I was able to jump into the Vue ecosystem and now I've, I've done Angular for the last three years at the company I'm at now. And I've been deep diving into React. So it's like all these frameworks start feeling the same. And after you get to know one really well, it's really easy. It becomes much easier to jump into another one. I mean, you, you agree with that, Dylan, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, there's obviously a learning curve and whatnot, but most of the time you're dealing with single page applications and data binding and, you know, components. And it's, it's made me think about like, you know, spas have been around for, I don't know, 10 years now, maybe a little longer. Um, and there really hasn't been a major shift in dynamic. I mean, maybe the, the closest thing we get is like the jam stack. That's a meme as far as I'm concerned, but it's, um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I wonder if anyone's thinking about what's really next and when it comes to sort of at least client-side development and 
Um, but maybe maybe this is it. Maybe the single page application is the final form of uh, most web development. Yeah, Any ideas, to David. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, it seems like the the uh, the framework community has. Well, actually, to go back to the point of like you know picking up another uh, different technologies, I totally agree with that because I think you know I first learned Ember, but then uh, when I started hopping into React, like it was pretty straightforward for me to pick up the component model just um, because I had already done it in Ember. And then when I started seeing some of those uh, component patterns in React land their way in Ember, then I was like, oh, some of this newer stuff is just like in React. So it was actually you know, mental model is kind of already there. It's just like minor syntax differences. So in terms of, yeah, if you're kind of new and you're learning, um, definitely good to kind of try out different things. And, uh, and and I think you'll, you'll, you know, take away a lot just by having tried different technologies. And um, yeah, and, and in terms of like the progression of frameworks, it's kind of seems like with, you know, Next and Nuxt and all those things, it's kind of going back to, um a more like batteries included style approach as opposed to just kind of the small here's react. Um, now you kind of have everything bundled together and, and you have like a little bit more out of the box. Um, you know, I haven't really used next or next or anything, but that's, you know, kind of what I've gathered, which kind of seems, you know, pretty in line with like angular and Ember too. Yeah. It sort of feels like we got this convention over configuration happening again, where originally reacts like, okay, you can just throw whatever router you want. You can throw whatever thing you want to build this. And Angular is like, Hey, here's that your HTTP library you should use. Here's a forms library you should use. Here's this, what you should use. And I think Ember's sort of the same way. You should probably use Ember <laughs> data. Like you should probably use, this is the way we do routing. This is the way we do this. And now like, like these frameworks, like Vue is also sort of like React in the way where you get more conventions with Vue, like if, especially if you use Vue CLI and just like use um, like React, create React app. But there's still like some things that you have to decide, but like these frameworks are just kind of uh, putting everything in into the box that you might need. That's a good, good analogy. I think this is, uh, I think we're going to wrap up the interview here. So Dylan, you have any... Last questions for David or thoughts or? No, no, I'm I'm good. David, you got anything uh, you want to talk about before we we peace out here? Uh, other than yeah, if anybody is interested in um, kind of writing a book, feel free to reach out. Just because um, now having gone through like both the self publishing route and the traditional publishing route, you know, I think you know, I have um, definitely thoughts on that and like you know some good takeaways. Would I do it again? Like, I mean, I would definitely do it again, but it, it's, um, yeah, if people have questions about it. You feel free to hit me up and ask me about it. Oh, well, 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 real quickly, how about just like within two minutes? I mean, what, what do you think? How was, how did you like creating the book through a traditional publisher versus just, uh, self-publishing? I liked it and I would definitely do it again. I think I got a lot more recognition just by comparing like, you know, my announcement tweets or, or posts on LinkedIn. And, and when I kind of did Ember data in the wild or pro Ember data, I think I got a lot more recognition. There's still that kind of um, like, you know, people see the traditionally published books, I think as like, you know, a bigger achievement, <laughs> whether it is or not. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I still would have gone, you know, that route, but I'm glad I kind of did the self publishing route first. Cause I got to, you know, try my hand at that and learn, you know, that is, um, you know, like it, it, overall, that was a pretty good experience. But um, yeah, I, I would still kind of, yeah, it's, uh, you know, both, both, I think, have their pros and cons. <laughs> yeah, we did a whole episode on traditional publishing versus uh, self-publishing. And I, I kind of gave a lot of advice, I thought, with traditional publishing. One thing, I, I like this hybrid approach that you're kind of talking about, David, where you first self-publish a book. And then the book is already written. And then you can, at some point, you don't have to, but at some point you can go to a traditional publisher and be like, hey, I self-published this book. You can even be like, here are the sales. Would you mind, how about we convert this into a traditional book? And so I think that would shortcut a lot of the issues with that I had with traditional publishing, just the super long cycles of editing and writing and editing and writing and editing. And then the, like, I think with Manning, we had like five or 10 different checkpoints where we had 
Uh, we actually had outside editors come in and read the book and then outside technical editors read the book that gave feedback. And then I had to take all their feedback and decide which was ones I wanted to keep and which ones, ones I didn't think I wanted to keep. And then I'd have to rewrite whole sections and chapters it, and that whole process just grates on you. And then the feeling of like self-publishing, you know, you and Dylan knows this r- real well. He's writing a book right now too. He's self-publishing a book that you have, you're, you're your own worst enemy. So you have to set your own deadlines. You have to set your own schedule, uh, which can be in a good and bad thing. But if you had a really bad week, you can just not work on the book for that week. In traditional publishing, your editor will get on your ass if you if you wait like a week or two and you don't create your your work and actually publish it or not publish it but turn it into them to look at so I, that i almost like that hybrid approach first if i ever write a book again i'm definitely going probably the self-published route yeah yeah i think yeah i totally agree with that um for me since i already had most of it written i was just kind of like handing it over and at the times they kind of reached out to me and said you know gave feedback it was it was a very like quick turnaround but there was also, you know, because I had already done a lot of it, it was actually a lot for me just, you know, of waiting. So I was like waiting for them to kind of put it together and all that. And, but then when I did have to give feedback, it was like one or two days. So it was very quick, but overall it was, um, if I, yeah, if I had to write another book again, I'd probably go the, the self-publishing route. Um, I, mean, I used Lane Pub, but, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of people like Gumroad, so I don't really know what the differences are there, but, you know, I think those would be like the two options I'd probably consider. The only caveat for me, though, is that I, I maybe one day I might, and maybe same thing for you, create an update to the book, because um, I would I would really like to one day, if I had time, to, to create a View three book uh, update because I did write a book on Vue.js and do a quick update on that. What do you What All do you right. think, Dylan? Any parting thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. I mean, when it comes to my my thought is to self publish and maybe down the road, you know, if after I feel like maybe I've reached my entire audience, go to the other route and sort of, because there is some uh, esteem that c- comes from being an author. And it's one thing to be like, oh, I have, a, I wrote my own book and I've self published. It's, it's sort of like, well, anyone can do that. Like, really, <laughs> at the end of the day. But like, when you go and you have a publisher that you're working with, um, it adds, um, you know, similar to like, you know, one of the reasons I built a course with LinkedIn. I mean, I've built tons of courses, but I want to do it with LinkedIn Learning just so that I could say I did with LinkedIn Learning. It gets a little bit more, you know, notoriety. Um, but I think probably if I had to guess from a financial perspective, you're going to keep so much more of the royalties doing something like Lean Pub than you are from a, a, a publisher. Um, and I can tell you from doing courses with publishers, I hate. I hate it. I like, I like, I've very much so, you know, going the self taught route. I like doing my own thing and I like doing it my own way. And so you have to sort of, it's a give and take when you, you know, you have a partner in anything. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like, I don't like how the, there's a little bit of a stigma for self sub publishing. People used to call it vanity press or vanity publishing. Cause it's like, you're only publishing it for yourself. And, and there's actually companies out there that you can pay. Um, it's almost the opposite of a normal publisher where you pay them to publish your book. So they'll they'll uh, they'll act as if they're your publisher and they'll give you an editor. And but I'm like, yeah, that's that's a little bit much. But uh, you know, last year we had a lot of people, especially in the tech Twitter community, create self-published books. A lot of them made like thousands of dollars. Uh, so it, it's, I think it is gaining in popularity. I've definitely seen quite a few big tech tech people start publishing books. And I also think it's also one of the easiest things to do when you're trying to make money online. People either blog and hope that they make enough money blogging by getting um, like advertising or people create books because they, uh, it seems like you just, if you can blog, you could probably create a book and then people can buy your book, but it's... In, in actuality, creating a, a book is, is really tough and usually doesn't make a ton of money. Yeah, some of those books I, that you were mentioning, I, I did buy you know a handful of books uh, in 2020. And what I did notice was that you know some people wrote some pretty short books, but they did have valuable content. And, and so they could take, uh, probably take away, you know, most, if not all of the profit. And, you know, I think everybody has like a unique experience of their own. And so, 
that, you know, that could be valuable to a handful of people out there. And so, you know, you could kind of write about what you know, and I think, uh, you know, people might be interested in, in kind of learning from that if, you know, whether it's like building their own tech career or, you know, getting that senior title or transitioning out of tech or whatever, right? Like, you know, I think everybody probably has a unique uh, experience that's valuable. Yep, for sure. So, wow, this this hour just flew by, David. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we'll add this to the show notes, but where can people reach you? Where people can buy, find your book? If they want yeah, to um, I, yeah. On tw- uh, so I'm on Twitter. It's uh, I am D Tang. Um, you know, I'm pretty active on there, so people can reach out to me there. And uh, my book is on Amazon or on on A Press. So you just search for Pro Ember Data, and uh, yeah, you'll come up. It, it should come up. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members and you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys, check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks and take care.